Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Uh, good day, everyone. Fossil fuels in transportation and industry account for a very large amount of greenhouse gas emissions and are the primary target in our battle to achieve net zero. More than 120 countries have already committed and accepted the challenge. Developing a net zero economy is multidimensional. Switching the energy system from fossil fuel to net zero requires thorough changes. The electrification of everything, building energy storage systems, batteries, hydrogen, at scales that have never been achieved, using recycled carbon fixed stock for chemicals and fuels, reassessing the role of nuclear energy, accelerating on energy efficiency, to name a few. It's not doing more research, which is key to decarbonize economy. Technologies already exist, and their deployment at large scale is the priority to progressively reduce emissions, capture the ones that can hardly be abated, implement carbon sinks to remove atmospheric CO2, all of these with the right dose of incentive and regulation. We must start now. Thus, it's a matter of effective dissemination of technology and increase of its accessibility so that all countries in the world can benefit. It's also a matter of policy tools, globally implemented, like carbon pricing. Circular economy is key to achieve that zero. Beyond the appeal of the concept, what does this mean in practice? What are the business models that can be created for such a drastic change in our supply chains? Reconstructing production system making them more local or less global, reusing materials and parts that have not yet reached their end of life. These are but a few undertakings that will need our attention in a new economic model. In a net zero economy, many factors play a role. The national context, in particular the industrial structure, the geopolitics of raw material and technology supply, cost, risk management and time to deploy, the availability of trained manpower, engineers, economists, lawyers. Well, to solve the challenge, industry, academia, and policymakers must work together to develop innovative models with the help of technology and a skilled workforce where each and every actor in the value chain can benefit. The stakes are high, but it's worth trying. I want to sincerely thank all the panelists and our moderator, Richard Hudson from Science Business, for accepting our invitation and disclose these complex issues and bring their insight to the Conference of Montreal attendees. A très grand merci au nom de Polytechnique Montréal. On behalf of Polytechnique Montreal, I wish you a great conversation. Thank you very much, Philippe. Uh, a very interesting introduction. Um, as you just described, uh, we are here talking about uh, green technologies for a carbon neutral economy. Um, can technology solve the problems or help solve the problems of sustainability and climate change? And if so, how and which technology? So it's a big topic we have. For that discussion, I should say I'm speaking to you at the moment from Washington. And we have speakers scattered all around elsewhere in this uh, uh, COVID era, um, but the um, including in Montreal itself. Uh, we're joined by uh, the, the panelist, Jocelyn Doucet. He's the co-founder and CEO of PyroWave, which is a Canadian uh, Quebec province startup uh, on plastics uh, recycling. We're also joined by Richard Florizon, uh, who is in Waterloo at the moment in Canada. Uh, he's the president and CEO of the International Institute for Sustainable Development, which is an independent think tank uh, dealing with, well, sustainable development. 
Uh, we are also joined from Brazil, Marina Grossi, who is president of the Brazilian Business Council for Sustainable Development. Welcome, Marina. And uh, Claude Villeneuve, uh, a professor at the University of Quebec, uh, uh, whose specialty is, of course, eco-sustainability and uh, related issues. Um, and lastly, uh, Lars Peter Lindfors, who is the Senior Vice President for Innovation at Neste, which is uh, one of the world's largest uh, recycling chemical uh, companies uh, dealing with and finding sustainable solutions. Thank you very much all for joining us. Um, I'm going to start with a really simple question to ask, but impossible to answer. Though I'm, I'm going to ask you to do it really quickly. Just give us an idea. Uh, we got into this problem of climate change with technology, with the Industrial Revolution uh, over, the, over the last couple of centuries. Can technology get us out of it? That's my question. So uh, who would like to begin with that? Well, I oh. can begin with that. Okay, oh. Marina, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I, I mean climate change for such a long time. And sometimes, you know, in the beginning of this, this discussion, if you say about technology to solve the problem, we would say, well, they want inaction. But I think this, this time is over. I, I think we need now, and you said before, and we need to scale, to scale green technology to get out of this and get net zero by 2050. Uh, the Paris Agreement decides to increase no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, and that was a political decision. And technology is the vehicle that is taking us for a cleaner and more developing, more sustainable world. So especially for Brazil, technology is a huge instrument, a huge tool uh, to access with our biodiversity asset. So we have a huge environmental asset, but we have to merge with technology. Okay, well, thank you very much. Claude, I saw you wanting to come in there. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I guess I guess you're wrong to uh, to say that we went into that with technology. Uh, in fact, uh, we went into climate problem more because of business as usual, more of the same, political short view, and generalized lack of efficiency encouraged by cheap fuel resources. If we don't make a paradigm shift, new technologies, emission reductions that will come, will be victim of the Jivan's paradox. Okay, all right. Lars? Yes, I, I think, I mean, I, I strongly believe that uh, technologies will solve the problem. It, it's all about, you know, uh, innovating, developing the new concepts, and also creating energy-efficient solutions. And I think that it's the only way out of this is really through innovation and technology. So. I'm a strong believer, I think, just that we have to think positively of the opportunities we have. But it won't be enough, surely, right? technology alone, right? Or yes or no? It, it, it will not be uh, enough alone, but without technology, there is no way out. That's what I'm basically meaning. Okay. Richard? Well, thanks. Uh, as, as Lars has just said, technology is necessary but not sufficient. As Marina said, we have to scale it. Um, let me give one, one way to think about it that I think about it that might be useful to the audience is I think on our path to 2030, the consensus is that we have the technology to get to 2030 along that, that roadmap, 2050. What we need to work is on adoption of those technologies. The path to 2050 is harder, deeper decarbonization um, and, and a greater role for, for actually, there's some technological uncertainty. So for a greater role for new technologies to actually get us to net zero all the way. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more development R&D that needs to happen to then. Adoption the next decade, we need to work hard on that, but we need to develop new tech beyond. Okay. Jocelyn, I can't see you at the moment, but I presume, believe you are there in Montreal. You hear me well? You hear me? Yeah. Yes, I okay, hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I like the way you started the question asking whether you know, technology got us into trouble. I, I think you know, the reason why technology or machines were invented in the first place was because we wanted to make uh, machine work instead of, of us in the first place. So we wanted to alleviate the relationship in you know, shaping or product, producing materials. And so I think that led to overproduction and overconsumption. So I think somehow technology can help us 
uh, you know, getting out of the situation where we are right now with fossil fuel, but I think we also have to revisit our relationship with consumption. Uh, can we improve the technologies we have right now that are making these things? Can we improve the machines? I think it's all about how decarbonizing these machines. And I think that's all the transition we have to look at, how we electrify or at least don't rely as much on, on fossil fuel to, to activate or, or, or motorize these machines or the technology that got us into this trouble. Okay. All right. Okay. So a, a quick uh, tour d'horizon uh, of everybody there. Thank you very much. Um, but let, let's get more specific now. Uh, which technologies are we talking about that are in most need of development and will be most important? for the future. Uh, Richard, if I can start with you, uh, what would be, what's, what in your view is the single most important technology that we have to focus on getting to work right? Well, Philippe Tanguy uh, uh, the, from Polytechnique actually addressed it in his opening remarks, electrify everything. If you're looking for, you know, what's the clearest bet, certainly between 20 and 30, what is the most common denominator in global uh, net zero plans or roadmaps? It's about electrification. Uh, which involves both the production and generation of clean electricity and its and its application. And that's because electrification offers often a double dividend. If you have green electricity, you get not just emissions reductions, uh, but improvements in efficiency, uh, avoiding the heat loss that you might have, say, with fossil fuels. So that's where I'd, I'd look. Uh, electrification is a hot spot. The only other thing I'll add, I know you only asked for one, uh, but I'm going to put a plug for a second, and uh, and that's about nature-based solutions. I think that we're saying we're seeing that there's great benefit for investments in nature that can actually prepare and protect us, mitigate against climate um, in ways that are much more cost-effective than kind of other types of traditional infrastructure. Uh, but the challenge is making those commercial. Thank you. Okay, well, let, let's all of us explore this electrification issue a little bit more. Uh, if all of you, you know, jump in if you want on your view on the, on electrification. But Richard, I'm going to ask. I see quick though. I mean, well, electrification may be fine, but where does that come from? I mean, ultimately, the energy for electricity has to come from somewhere, which at the moment is probably <coughs> sustainable. In it's, most clearly, it's clearly a diversified mix. So if you look at kind of global projections, um, you know, it's fairly likely we're going to have to get to kind of a doubling of electricity supply by most estimates, depending on, on, uh, on demand, as other speakers have spoken to. We need, we need a doubling through 2050. Um, it's clear that wind and solar have been quite phenomenal in terms of their cost curves coming down. There's still some intermittency issues, and so a lot of talk about batteries. Uh, and then there's some technological uncertainty, right? What will be the role of fission? What will be the potential role of fusion? These things are uncertain. So I think we see some encouraging costs, trajectories in renewables that will play a big role, uh, but still a big role for technology trying to drive basically a doubling, I would say, of a clean electricity supply through to 2050. The rest of you, how do you feel about that? A doubling of electricity sustainably, is that feasible? Oh, maybe I can give an example in the, yeah. Um, yeah, in the um, you know, circular economy, which, which is the era we're in. Uh, if we look at the Ellen MacArthur uh, statistics showing that 45% of our global emission come from production of, of, of products, so from manufacturing, that's essentially because the processes that are making the commodities that most of our product contain uh, rely on thermal or fossil-powered processes. Uh, so mainly they're burning something to activate and power the process. Uh, if we look at nature, someone talked about nature-based solutions. Nature draws all the energy from the sun, essentially. That, that's where the energy comes from. And, and there's no one debating whether or not the sun or nature consumes too much energy. So we're not really uh, you know, questioning whether or not the, the nature is energy efficient because the energy source is carbon free. Like it's not, it's not emitting any, any carbon emissions. Uh, so I think that that's the relationship we need to have with our, our commodity business, or at least revisiting some of the processes that have been around for a century old or, or even more producing these commodities. And in particular in our space with plastics, where, you know, the processes that are still running right now have been pre-World War II and have not been significantly improved in terms of what type of energy mix they're using. Uh, so we're proposing that you know, we need to revisit these processes and rely on, on, on carbon-free or electricity mix uh, that, can, that can perform this, uh, th th these activities. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lars, you wanted to speak on that? Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I, I don't think there is one, one silver bullet. We need to embrace all the different solutions in parallel. Electrification is part of the solution, that's clear, but it will not do it all. We need to find the other solutions as well. So from my, my take then as, as one example is, 
is utilizing waste streams from, uh, from uh, bio and circular economies, making uh, liquefied fuels and chemicals from those. Okay. And well, I'll, yes. Yeah. yes. Go ahead, Marina. You wanted to um, we'll come back to no, that? Yeah, I, I think there are so many uh, possibilities locally that we have to look out uh, in a very specific way. Uh, depends on the country. So wind, wind and solar improving in Brazil a lot and it's becoming mu much cheaper than other uh, sources of energy. Um, but I, you asked me about technologies, what is the most important one? And I will uh, assume that uh, at least for developing countries, and especially for Brazil, I think, you know, really think about by economy, nature-based solutions is a key uh, topic for us. Uh, we can have uh, $17 billion generated by nature-based solutions by 2030. And uh, there is a lot of, uh, if you think about the Amazon bioma, I mean, I think, I think the Paris Agreement cannot uh, be, in, be real uh, and we reach 1.5 if we, we, we devastate the Amazon bioma. So we, we have to find a ways to to, uh, you know, get the forest, preserve it. And I think there are so many ways to get that. <clears throat> Nature-based solutions is one of those. And I think there is a, also a high value added in bioeconomy uh, on, based on Brazilian biomas. Uh, who they, can they can store one million natural molecules that are still unknowing to science and that can hold the cure for ills such as cancer and diseases in the central and nervous system. So there is a lot of things that we still don't know that can belong from, from nature-based solutions. Okay, okay, but I'm, I'm to, to Marina, Claude, Lars, I'm, I'm confused. What is a nature-based solution specifically? What, what technology are you talking about? Well, there are so many um, examples that we can uh, have, um, but yeah. you said about, yeah, you said about, uh, you know, uh, a circular economy. So for, for Brazil and for, uh, 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 we can have, you know, the, the burns used by acai, that is a product from Amazon. Uh, we lost, uh, we only keep the seed of the acai and we lost all the, the rest of the fruit but we can use and replace <coughs> coal, for instance. So that's something, that's an, a good example. But there are other examples for cosmetics, for instance, and Natura has been leading at the Amazon Bioma for uh, 20 years. And there is a lot of uh, products that we can have from there. Uh, that's also a lot of uh, examples for, for keeping the nature uh, alive. And that's also example for forests. Uh, uh, we have um, we, we have to preserve and to deal with the forest. Forest in Brazil, uh, it's a, a big asset that we have. We can, uh, in the future, uh, building cities with a, a forest, you know, if we do it in the right way. So that's a lot of things and a lot of examples that we can come from nature-based solutions. But, but you get a, a nice point. That's one of the discussions that we're going to have in Glasgow because there are different perceptions of nature-based solutions. But biofuel is one, you know, uh, there is other things that uh, we can think about, uh, <coughs> chemicals, pharmacals, well, cosmetics, and so many others. Okay, well, I can think of lots of, lo lots of nature-based solutions that are not necessarily going to help on sustainability. I mean, you know, uh, the use of, uh, of uh, ethanol and gasoline is often criticized now as, it, as creating another problem in itself. Claude. What on earth is this nature-based solution? That's well, I, I disagree oh, about Marina, ethanol. Marina, hold, hold on, Claude, we're coming okay. up. Yeah, about about nature-based solutions, there are uh, some which are or not technology. And uh, planting trees, for example, uh, with the right tree at the right place and the right care for the tree for keeping carbon and giving other services as some kind of nature-based solutions. But just to, to recap this question, there is no silver bullet, as was said before, it, but there may be silver buckshots. We have to look at wedges, billion ton by billion ton, in different uh, places. For example, uh, we should stop. Uh, things that are obvious, like deforestation, red meat consumption, 
fossil fuel extraction. Okay, uh, as first of all, these have to be shrinked in the first time. Uh, this will force uh, other technologies, uh, technological feasible solutions to uh, be interesting for uh, for development. And, and <coughs> for example, uh, technologies such as artificial meat could be interesting to look at in a climate uh, solution uh, pattern. And Claude, Claude, is it is, I, I'm tempted to ask, though, okay, take the case of artificial meat. Is, is the challenge the technology of making it, you know, better and better and better? Or is the challenge just getting people to use it? Is, is this a social or a technical problem we have to deal with? This, this is the, the second point I want to make. Is okay. that we have absolutely <coughs> no use to look at in silos. We have to have an overview of the system. Okay? It, it gives nothing to have electrical cars, as was said, if we continue to produce with fossil fuels, the electricity. Uh, and if we continue to drive personal cars, we will get into the Jevons uh, paradox because uh, somewhere, someone will have to extract natural resources to make more personal cars. And electrical cars are jammed in the traffic as every car. And this, if you don't have uh, an overview, if you don't have a systemic conception, uh, then you will not solve problems. You will create new problems with uh, implementing uh, kind of, of partial solutions. And, and this is very interesting because in systemic uh, sustainability assessment that we uh, teach in, uh, in our university, uh, we are always looking at the global, including behaviors, including uh, citizens' uh, uh, knowledge, <coughs> including technologies. And altogether, you can make a solution which is much more efficient for example, using uh, loss heat, uh, we 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 lose so much energy through uh, to uh, heat losses that uh, we could probably reduce emissions by maybe thirty or forty percent just in uh, using this lost energy in in, uh, yeah. in in conceiving, for example, new industrial parks or industrial ecology. Uh, these, these are solutions that must be global. Okay. Lars, let, let me come to you. This, this nature-based or bio-based, so, I mean, there's the different terms, but they are related. What, what, what is, how difficult is achieving significant uh, uh, carbon savings through these technologies technologically? I mean, is it a technical challenge and how good? Well, if we start from the from the forestry, agricultural waste and residues, I mean, uh, there are technologies available. It is a question of, of getting the scale. Again, I think coming back to the discussion earlier, I mean, the, the big ticket item is, of course, replay, making the energy transition, replacing more and more crude oil with more sustainable solutions. That's where the big ticket items are in the energy sector. And I think that... Uh, we need to, to combat this challenge by very many uh, different means. And there are already existing solutions uh, that we are able to scale up in terms of utilizing waste and residues. Like and another, for instance? For instance. From, forest, from forest. To make chemicals, of course, there is a lot of oxygen in, in cellulose, lignocellulosic, cellulosic, so you can make chemicals out of it as well. But anything that basically replaces crude oil, whether it's chemicals or any other kind of energy, direct energy production, is good for us, right? So we should really think of this in a broader way. And algae, for instance, I think that's a very exciting area, which also our company is looking into right now, to have in, 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 in where, where we don't need to use, let's say, good land for that <coughs> developing of kind of solutions from direct photosynthesis. So taking carbon dioxide and sunlight, as, as was mentioned before to get uh, both oils and protein. 
And I think this is quite an exciting world that is still just emerging. But there are already, in smaller scale, there are already technologies available. Just pick that algae one for a moment. So what, sta- what stage of development are we in, uh, in, the, in the development of that? How quickly do you think it could actually make a difference? Well, I, I think it has exactly the same challenge as most of the other areas here, even including the, the electrification. I mean, the scale we need is so huge that nothing will solve it alone immediately. But that's what I think we need to understand that these things take time. But we are progressing. So to answer your question on algae, we are basically in the piloting phase as we speak. Meaning, uh, what are, do, does your company have any particular plans that are going pilots on this at the moment? Well, we, we, ha- we are having plans that we would have first commercial quantities of one of the innovation platforms <laughs> we are working on now. One is algae. The other ones are municipal solid waste and ligno that we will have commercialization happening by 2030. In one of these, that's our okay. object. Okay, jo- Jocelyn, uh, you you're dealing with another aspect of, of the uh, of sustainability and recycling, right? With plastics, right? Well, you know, I, I was just going to go back to your nature-based solutions. So the one thing I have in mind when I think of this is the green uh, chemistry principles from John John Warner, and you know, just to imagine what what na- nature-based solutions look like when you look at nature, the way chemistry is performed. It always operates at pr- room temperature, atmospheric pressure, and mainly in aqueous solutions like in water. Whereby when you look at the way we do chemistry in, in industry, we're at high pressure, high temperature, and very rarely only in water. And that's because we want to speed up the reactions. Not ho- that's why we speed up by adding you know, more pressure and more temperature. So what I'm trying to say here is that, and someone talked about the scale here that's massive. So the industry has developed their processes for 100 years and more. And so now we operate at a very large volume scale, and we operate at a very small time scale. So we want to do things very fast in large volumes. And so we've, if you want to shift from, from this type of chemistry to a nature-based chemistry, then it's going to take longer, it's going to take much bigger equipment, and you're going to have to change all that infrastructure that's been built over the years. And so this is some of the, you know, some of the challenges that we face. So although these look like really nice solutions, uh, it, it is not easy to implement, as, as most people mentioned. So, in, in the how, circuit, much, how, how much money is involved in all of this? Do you think on these? Uh, any of you? Do you have an idea as to uh, if money were the only problem, which of course it isn't? Uh, is there enough now? Well, maybe, it? maybe, maybe I'll, I'll give you an order of magnitude okay. just because they're, they're so in the plastic world. Okay, we are trying to scale technologies that are going to make renewable feedstock based, you know, starting from, yeah. from raw material that is waste. And, and so you have a whole bunch of logistic issue and cost issue related to sourcing that feedstock, which is not a crude, uh, you know, crude feedstock comes from uh, a pipeline. And so it's very easy for people to understand that conveying oil in a pipeline is very cost effective. As a matter of fact, we've been doing it for so long that now we know that this is the most cost efficient way of conveying that liquid. However, when you turn into renewable processes where we're, fee- we're sourcing waste as a feedstock, now the waste is not a liquid, so we cannot pipeline that waste material into a pipe. And so therefore, there are limitations coming from to just the logistic of the material. And in terms of the infrastructure, I'm just going to finish on that. The, if you look at the order of magnitude of investment that the industry is putting in new infrastructure for plastic production from virgin material, we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars. And there are, these are just the new projects that have been announced in an era where apparently we want to reduce our consumption, or at least we want to reduce the footprint of plastic being made. Uh, whereby when you look at the amount of money that's being invested in sustainable solutions, uh, it seems like millions of dollars of order of magnitude is always a problem. And so we're really operating in a two, three orders of magnitude difference here where uh, you know, investing in the status quo is always more interesting because the logistic is all in place. The supply chain is well established. The infrastructure is already amortized for so long that is that the business as usual is very comfortable. Whereby changing to a more renewable source of feedstock to a new type of process involves essentially just collapsing the existing industry and then starting a new industry. And so this is why you have all that inertia that we see that is slowing slowing down a lot of the efforts. Mm-hmm. Okay, but, but to come to this specifically the case of plastics again. The, uh, the question that occurs to me, so you talk about the difficulty 
of getting the feedstock to the <laughs> to the uh, uh, recycling process. Correct. Um, well, another solution would be simply to stop making the plastic. So, <laughs> which is, which is the best way to do it? Which is, uh, well, if I if I may if I may talk here uh, about so I think I think it's, a, it's a both these are both points that are very valid. If I take a very simple example, if you have all these single-use items like little forest or little killery or straws or things like that, you may have the best downstream process to convert it back into its original chemicals and, and, and allow closed-loop recycling. The fact is that right now there's no way for us to pick it up, meaning that if you use your straw, you put it in a bin, you put it in a recycle bin, there is no way right now with the chemical and mechanical and the truck and the handling and everything, it's going to end up entering this process. So meaning that is that, is that the real good material for this type of application? So I, I think right now we need to really put the functionality at the center of the decision of whether or not this material is the best for this application. And I believe right now the cost is driving the decision more than the functionality. And so we're taking, we're putting plastic in so many different applications just because it's cheap, not because it is the right material to put it in. And the counter example of this is, you know, I'm sure people have cars, so we all have cars. You know, my dad had a car back in the years and it was a metal bumper and this metal bumper, you know, you can never scratch it. Like essentially it was, you know, it was, you could never break it up. Now it's all plastic bumpers. I keep changing plastic bumpers all the time. Is this the right material for this application is the same kind of question one might ask as it is the same question one might ask. Is it the right material for single use items? So yes, I think we need to revisit that relationship with that material. That means reducing our consumption in the first place and then addressing how we deal with the end of life of that material. Although, if it is the best material for the lifetime where it's been used, now we have to deal with the end of life. And that's what, okay. we're, that's what we're looking so, at. So this is, we'll come back to this more, but this is actually more a matter of uh, uh, fiscal policy right. and, uh, and, and social uh, uh, behavior, uh, nudge, nudging, as it were. Richard, could I come to you? You, mentioned, you also mentioned nature best. Well, I want to, I thank you because I want to jump in, and I got to say, you know, it's great to hear from everyone. But I, I think, especially from from leaders like Jocelyn, who are business leaders out there making these changes, I want to amplify something he said about the cost. If you look at our problem, our climate problem, but the biodiversity crises, the kind of our our problem with nature. If you look at it from that end of things, you see that you know when you're talking about cost, Richard. Um, you know, you're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars a year that are needed to kind of restore our relationship with nature. Um, and those numbers can sound mammoth, but I, the reason I want to point out to Jocelyn's point is when you weigh it against kind of capital investment plans or overall economy, you know, a lot of studies are coming out in the past year talking about a couple of percent of GDP to decarbonize. So this is doable, right? This is not, and, that, and that's just viewed as a cost. Now, uh, imagine that there's going to be new investment opportunities and new efficiencies that will come out of it. Take wind and solar, where you've seen the cost now is cheaper than, than coal plants. So, so that's possible on the cost. On, on nature-based solutions, I'll just say, and I apologize for opening up that, that can of worms because it set the panel down, down that side. But the reason, the reason, when we talk about nature-based solutions, what we're talking about is, is investments or projects in nature that benefit nature, but also have other benefits, maybe for a manufacturing process or something else, as Jocelyn's pointed out. I'll give you the simplest example for, your, for, for the audience, yeah. and that is restoration of wetlands. So when you restore, wet, to, to protect against flood, so when you restore wetlands, what you're doing is you're dealing with all that storm water and you're preventing flooding, which of course saves lives, uh, saves property, but it can also, in the right projects, help farmers, right? They're able to, the, land, the lands aren't flooded. So you get, you get a better economic return. You get a better social return because people aren't hurt. And you get a better economic return because the restoration of those wetlands isn't, uh, is cheaper than building a dam or something like that, right, in the right circumstances. So it's trying to find those solutions that are positive for nature and people in the economy. Now, that's tough, requires scale, but that's why I mentioned it as in addition to electrification that, you know, for business leaders, look for those sweet spots. You know, we're not just dealing with a climate crisis. We're not just concerned about carbon. We're worried about things like a species loss and, and biodiversity. And so nature-based solutions done right can be a way to benefit people and the planet. The, the extent, to, Richard, the, so if you're looking at the different kinds of, you mentioned one specific nature-based solution, fine. But if you look over the panoply of them that we've been discussing and other ones, do you have any feeling as to which are the ones that should be prioritized? You know, it's a really hot space right now. Um, 
I think that when it comes, when you look at it from an environmental lens, I think some of the projects that are most interesting from a private sector participation viewpoint are, are projects in forestry, where you can have timber production and other things. And, and I think some of the industrial processes, I'll let Jocelyn speak to that, because I think that's a lot of excitement. I think what people are trying to figure out right now is that when it comes to restoring nature, we can't, look, nature is worth its investment in its own right, and we're going to continue to have public dollars investing in it. But if we want to really deal with this crisis with nature, we've got to find a way to mobilize private sector capital to embed it in our processes exactly as Jocelyn has, has spoken to. And that's why I really wanted to elevate, elevate his, his, uh, his remarks. I think that uh, I think some of the most obvious ones, as I mentioned around wetlands, the most promising ones have to do with floods. Uh, from my perspective, uh, and water control is where you see the most promise for things like nature-based solutions. Okay. Marina, could, could I come to you? I mean, uh, uh, if, as you are from Brazil, as you know, uh, your, your co- government, your country, has come under some criticism from uh, considerable from green organizations about the Amazon. So, to, to what ex- to bring us up to date a little bit on, on, on this aspect of it, and specifically, is technology a help, a possible help for, for, for this, for the preservation and the extension of the Amazon? No, I think uh, technology is the key to help if you combine technology with the environmental assets, with biodiversity. There are so many examples. And I think that the point is, uh, Richard, uh, if we have to preserve biodiversity, if you have to keep the forest, you know, uh, and have to preserve it, we have to have a way for that. We have to get value for that. And there is some, you know, answers that we are talking now in Brazil, especially uh, if you think about deforestation in Brazil, uh, uh, 40% uh, of our uh, reduction in emission, you know, could uh, if, we, if you zero deforestation in Brazil, we can uh, really uh, uh, meet our target in, in our NDC. So it's huge, the value that deforestation has in Brazil. It's huge. Mm-hmm. And you, especially if you think about illegal deforestation in the biome of Amazon, it's about 98%. Of course, we have to get you know, value for those people that live there. We have to, uh, to preserve the forest. And, and there are so many ways. I, I think, you know, we, you heard some. Uh, there is uh, companies uh, in chemistry, oil and gas, Shell is, is there, uh, in mining, um, in cosmetics, in, in so many, so many different uh, areas uh, that's working there to, to think in, in think in a different way. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to suggest one thing that I, I think Brazil can, can do uh, for this is about carbon credit. You know, we don't have a market on carbon credit. In Cebedes, where I'm, I'm the president of Cebedes, uh, we have about eight big companies. And all those eight big companies are saying, well, we have to price, you know, the emissions. We have to have a market in Brazil. And uh, not taxation, but we have to have a market in Brazil because it's more transparent. transparent. Um, and we have this discussion uh, by 2017. And now the discussion is, is coming to the legislative and we are thinking about have a project, uh, a deputy there wants to, to improve and get before Glasgow, you know, a carbon market in Brazil. So those are the discussions for industry area, but also that ha- we can have offset and help, you know, uh, forest and agriculture. That is our biggest emission. So we can offset uh, uh, in agriculture and, and, and forests. So that's one way that we can lead uh, to preserve biodiversity in Brazil, uh, to have a market, uh, but also uh, we have another ways. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we hear some of those solutions. But I think there is a big shift in the mind of, um, you know, of the leaders uh, in business. Uh, if you think about not all, not all the solutions will be, you know, uh, ordinary solutions. I think someone will be very disruptive and there will be losers in these discussions. Uh, if you think about electric cars, for instance, you know, we have, uh, we are getting out of the combustions in the electric cars, in the, in the vehicles for the, tomorrow. So there are losers in this, in this process and, and there are disruptive 
you know, technologies that we have to face. Uh, but I think uh, we have to combine those technologies, but also in a ways that help companies such as uh, pricing the carbon, uh, pricing one externality, you know, that help us, uh, the companies to make the shift for a uh, low carbon economy. Okay. The, 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 we've talked about some of the specific technologies that are possible, but are there, what common obstacles are there? To, we've talked a little bit about money. Uh, you know, you, you, Marina, you just spoke about the, uh, um, the, the question of dealing with those who would lose in the process. I know in Europe at the moment, there's a lot of concern that there might be a, uh, a revival of the Gilets Jaunes, uh, the protests in France. Is, 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 so this is a, an abiding problem. But first, just all of you, on purely on the technology if we're looking at, are there any consistent problems with, with, that run through several of these technologies? Well, I'd, I, I can talk to that. So yeah. the, the one main obstacle we see in the technology shift is because you're shifting from a traditional industry to a new industry, and you're re-questioning essentially all the basis of what the current industry is doing, you face a lot of resistance from the, from the actual industry. And so you're fighting, with, you're fighting against very well-established integrated companies that have worked their supply chain, that have worked their assets for so many years, it's very difficult to displace. So even if you have the best technology, if you have a much more promising, uh, low carbon, whatever, more efficient technology, is it really worth changing all the assets and shifting to a new, uh, to a new type of technology if this is what you've been doing for so long? So I think that's one of the major resistance. I, I think the other main element is that, you know, the main element of differentiation that our technologies bring is a lower carbon for making the same service. So essentially you're making the same product with a lower carbon footprint or you deliver the, the same kind of service but with a lower carbon footprint. But how is it that it's not showing up on the balance sheet of any companies? Like why is there, why is there no carbon pricing? So if you have the same service delivered but you do not have any financial element showing up on your P&L or balance sheet, why would you change? Why would you, why, why would you make that change? So I think these are the two, two main elements. Well, then, then, so on that second point, what you're you're saying that the government should should uh, revise the way they uh, uh, you know they, they regulate uh, the stock market and financial disclosure, or what uh, is it? A, or is the problem of lobbying by old industries? Where, where where is this? Where does one attack this problem? Well, I was just, just going to say one thing, but yeah. the one yeah. element that the government can do that no one else can do is voting laws, right? So it starts from there. We're not asking government to, to be so present in all the elements of the businesses, but if they could just vote the proper regula regulation framework, put the proper sets of rules that are equal to everyone, I think that would be a really good start. And that means putting the proper carbon policies or proper carbon pricing so that things show it off on a P&L, uh, having targets for recycled content. If you want people to start adopting recycled material in their product, then you need to have the proper policies and framework that that allows for integrating recycled content into new products, but also that will deal that, you know, waste is not a waste. Waste is now a feedstock. And, and right now you have a whole bunch of obstacles from a regulatory stand, standpoint that, that prevents anyone from taking waste as a raw material because it's, con, you know, it's been treated very differently in, in the regulation for so many years. So these are like examples of things that the government can alleviate or can rework, making sure that you have the proper sandbox for these technologies to emerge. Okay. Okay, Lars, you wanted to come in. Yes, I would like to fill in that. I mean, for instance, in the, <clears throat> in the um, transportation sector, there are incentives for the renewable fuels, which, of course, are, are very important because we are able to decrease the carbon dioxide emissions by 90%. So I think exactly what was said, that we need to have this kind of regulatory and incentivized ways to embrace the new technologies in all of the sectors. So specifically, That's, Lars, in aviation, for instance, so uh, is, is that what you mean? Uh, incentives needed for that? Well, there are coming on board already these kind of mandates for renewable aviation fuels, which, which by the way, our company is also now commercializing yeah. already. So, I mean, there are incentives in certain areas, but the question is, of course, this energy sector is so huge that there are many areas where there still is a lot of work to do. Um, if I may, Richard, still on the comment on, on what is the challenge, I still come back to the, the scale up, the, the huge uh, 
uh, upscaling that is needed in all of these alternative solutions. And also that we are embracing all of them at the same time, because every region in the, on the globe is different and not one suit fits everybody. So, what, so what's the obstacle on upscaling? Is it simply the money to have the pilots and the demonstrators or what? Is it enough people? Well, it's time. I would say it's, it's, it's mostly time. I mean, actually, it will take a long time to get such capacities, even if we combine all of the different solutions to really replace crude oil to a large extent. To be a little bit of a realist, unfortunately. Yeah, if, but, I may, if, uh, I, if I may just say one thing, just one number. You know, we're talking about 100 million barrels a day. This is what we're yes. this is what we're drawing from the ground. This is this is a, this is huge. And if you're trying yes. to displace this, you know, the first thing we've always heard from from the existing industry is that oh, it's too it's too large. Like you don't have the capacity, and so they don't want to start because they see this as a, as a tiny water drop in the ocean compared to the 100 million barrels a day. I, rem- I just want to remind this. This is this is the scale we're talking about here. Okay, thank you, yeah. Richard. Richard, could I just jump in with one? Yeah, maybe a, maybe a, sim- a simple action. Um, look, when I was uh, when I was president of Dalhousie University, you know, you have thirty thousand students, staff, faculty. You know, you're running a big organization, so I have I have some uh, some sympathy for the C-suite. Uh, folks who are in your audience today are in our audience today. You know, you've got a lot of issues to deal with. I think the one piece of advice I'd give you is if you're motivated by this is, you know, strike a team, strike a team and initiative inside your organization to go look for energy technology savings that can save energy, reduce carbon, and it can be positive for nature because they're out there. The biggest resounding thing I hear from um, uh, clean tech entrepreneurs is the issue of adoption, that they've got ideas that have a positive IRR, that have a great payback and a po- really positive NPV, Right. Um, but they can't kind of cut through because they're stuck at one level of the company, you know, and they can't kind of cut through the building management and CFO and everything else to, to get at those issues. So a bit of C- I agree we need incentives. There's a lot that needs to happen here. But the path, the, but the fact is, you know, the path to 2030, we have some technology to make a real dent in this. And it's, and, and it's set technologies that can save money while being good for companies and align them with where consumers are going. Okay, so Richard, uh, and by the way, we have, a, we have just a few minutes left in this discussion. So, but we have COP26 coming up in Glasgow. Uh, what's the most important thing in Ray technology that one might hope would come out of that meeting or a subsequent meeting? What should the governments do about to accelerate the uptake of these technologies? Or it, you can, you cannot solve the problem that way. You there there is an elephant in the, in the beast, which is the carbon price. Uh, actually, we need same level playing field and international carbon price that will be uh, captured in the net zero uh, supply chain. An international carbon price. So an international way. carbon price, uh-huh. which will allow lands to, to say, uh, okay, we have a carbon price. We will take at the border the, the, the price of carbon if it's, not, uh, if it's not paid before. With an international carbon price and border taxes or adjustments, then you will have the same level playing field and you will... Uh, be able to scale up technologies which are reducing carbon and that can prove it. And if you want government to invest in a new technology, then they have to make a carbon assessment before, before the subsidy. And, and, and as long as you are taking carbon and you're paying nature services, in the uh, in, in the, the, the sum of uh, of your price for a supply, then the economy can play its game, but okay. with no uh, level, uh, no, no same level playing field, uh, with all the the crooks that are around. You know? <laughs> okay. Someone so, said you, there is a sucker born every minute, <laughs> but there is a crook born every hour. <laughs> oh well. I, 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 uh, what can I say? It sounds like you're speaking about a certain former American government. Oh, I, say, <laughs> I, say, I say in Washington. But, but, so, but Claude, wow, international carbon pricing. Uh, Marina, what, what would you tell the ministers to do in Glasgow? Well, we are telling them here in Brazil 
to work on Article 6 that's about carbon pricing, that's about international markets globally. Uh, Brazil is, uh, is also have to, to, to make a, a, to help these solutions uh, to come. So we have a contribution on Article 6, that's what uh, he just said. But we also have to have ambition and, and uh, NDC more bold because we are not facing and, and really reaching 1.5 degrees. And I think the point is that we have to need, we need carbon markets, but we need to speed up. We need to scale, but we need to still speed up. And, not, and that won't be in a very regular basis. So as much okay. as we have our international framework to, to help the losers and to help the other companies that are, are not uh, so, so ahead of this, that would be great okay. for, for nice. the whole world. Lars, what would, what would you tell yeah, them to do? Let's go. I, I fully agree with Claude about the level playing field. I think that's a, that's a very, very important thing. I mean, if the regulators and politicians put the carbon dioxide emissions at the center, they will embrace any technology that can uh, contribute to solving that problem. And that's, I think, something that sometimes politicians and regulators tend to go into the technologies and 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 favor certain of those, depending on where you are on the globe, is different. But I think that we should, we should try to avoid and really embrace all the technologies through a level playing field. Okay. All right. Jocelyn, what would you tell the ministers to do? Oh, I mean, everything has been said already, but uh, no, I agree. It's, it's, it's all about capturing the well, added actually, value. Of- that's the problem. Too many messages come into this. And so governments, you know, it's difficult to focus for, for <coughs> politician, I suppose. Oh, no, like I said, it's, it's if the main differentiator is really having the, 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 delivering the same product with a lower carbon footprint, you need to have a mechanism by which you capture it on the balance sheet. And right now it's not the case. And, and, and so for someone that's making a financial analysis, analysis of, of these new technologies and implementation of these new technologies, they're going to come to the conclusion that there's no return on investment because there's no gain whatsoever on the financials of the company. So you need to have a way to capture this at the financial level. And, and one way to do this is the carbon, carbon tax or having the border adjustment tax, which is something that Europe is, is actually currently implementing. In our circular economy world, we, we, we push a lot for minimum recycle content in your products. So if you, wanna, you know, if you want people to recycle more or you want to create value for these recycled material, you need to create demand. So these are the kind of things that we're asking governments to put these incentives to actually force uh, companies to change. Because as, as, as Claude mentioned in the, in the beginning or some other people mentioned on the panel, the technologies are there, and um, I think it's no longer a technical feasibility problem. It's how do you implement them and how do you scale them? And one way to do that is to have the proper commercial and financial environment that uh, creates adoption and, and, and let the economy plays its role. That's a very interesting point and actually a good one that we can end on now, that simply that the technology is there, well, coming. Uh, it's still, there's still a lot of work going on. Uh, but it is these broader issues of, of law, finance, social behavior that uh, will actually determine whether we succeed. So with that, I'd like to thank all of the panelists and our audience.